So you guys remember what we're doing? We're in a series. We're on week seven about some questions that the disciples asked Jesus. And we're seeing from Jesus' answers that the best is yet to come. That we can have a victorious view of the future. And that the things that you see on the television screen are nothing. God's, as the psalm says, God sits on his throne and laughs. And we should be laughing right along with him, right? And this discussion, this discussion that Jesus has with his disciples was on the Mount of Olives. And what happened was Jesus just proclaimed a severe judgment on Jerusalem and the Jewish leaders of his day. And that was found in Matthew 23. This, of course, caused the disciples to have some questions, right? See, whenever I say something provocative or something new or something, it causes you guys to have questions. And this is what happened with Jesus. Jesus just said that, that this whole, the temple, Jerusalem, was going to be utterly destroyed, that there wasn't going to be one stone left on the other, and all, all of the righteous blood from, from Abel to, to Zechariah would come on that generation. The judgment of that would come on their gener generation. So here's these disciples thinking that Jesus is the new king that's going to set up his earthly kingdom, and he just said that everything's going to be destroyed. So, of course, they had some questions, and they went on the Mount of Olives, and they asked these questions, and they had three of them. And In Matthew 23, verse 3, it says, As he, Jesus, was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us, when will these things happen, and what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? So you have three questions. The first question we already covered, when will these things happen? Speaking of the destruction of, the, of, Israel, or of, of, of Jerusalem and the temple, and we see that history. I mean, it, Jesus was right on with his prophecy on what would happen to, to Israel in the temple. And then we've seen question number two, what will be the sign of your coming? And we, we, understand, we understand this. This was not them not talking, thinking that Jesus was going to have a second coming because they never thought he was going to die in the first place. This was about him coming into his kingdom, him revealing himself as the true king of Israel and the Messiah. And we answered that last week. And this week we're going to talk about the end of the world. Doesn't that sound like fun? Everybody wants to know about the end of the world, right? So when we get done here, you're going to hear when the end of the world's going to be and what it's going to be like when the end of the world happens. Interested? We're going to cover a lot of scripture today. For some, this might be more scripture than you read all year long. But you got to understand something. I, because I, I, I was kicking this around in my head. Should I just paraphrase? You know, just kind of recap some of these parables that Jesus is telling. You know, just to make it go quicker. And then I thought, if the disciples could sit there and listen to what ha his judgment that happened in, in the temple, then he comes out, goes to the Mount of Olives, and answers all three of these questions in one sitting. I think we can we can listen to Jesus' words like the disciples did. Amen? Amen. So we've, we've covered those answers. Today's the third, the third question, and it's a, lo a long, continued discourse about the end of the age. If you, ever, if you guys have a red-letter edition Bible, do you know what that red-letter edition? All the words, all the words that Jesus speaks is in red. And you will see that from where we pick up in Matthew 24, all the way through Matthew 25, is all red. So you ready? You know, I got a, I got a Bible that uh, not only has the uh, words of Jesus in red, but in the Old Testament, all the words of God are in red, too. It's kind of cool. So, yep, yep. So this is one nonstop, this is Jesus nonstop teaching to his disciples. In Matthew 24, verse 35, it says, it says, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. But of the day 
and hour, no one knows. So when will this happen? No one knows. No, no one knows. So I don't care how many blood moons happen. I don't care how many evidences that you have that Jesus is coming back, 84 reasons Jesus is coming back in 1984 or whatever. The, no one knows. This is right from Jesus' lips. Look, at, look, look what he goes on to say. But of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father alone. You know, I, I heard a pretty cool, a pretty cool, uh, um, I don't know if it's, I heard it, so I don't know if it's ac totally accurate. But they say that when a, a, a Jewish boy um, is, wants to get married, he has to build onto his father's house a bridal chamber. And as he's building that bridal chamber, he doesn't know when he's done with it. He's not done until his father inspects it and says, you're right. Okay, you're done. You go get your bride. And I heard someone tie this into that the son doesn't know. See, there, there, there are people coming into the kingdom. Thank God that God waited, right? Because I made it. Right? There, 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 his, his table is going to be full. Right? And I want to point out, I want to point out here, the word of that day, in that hour. See, understand when, we, when it uses words like the day and the hour, that's different than the end of days, right? This is talking about a particular point in time. It also uses phrases like the great day or the last day or sometimes the day. It refers to, this is referring to one particular day in time the Bible calls Judgment Day. And not just any judgment, but the final and great judgment of all humanity and nations. God will call all to account at the end of the world, right? So let's look at the, the, those phrases in Scripture. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, we did, did, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons and in your name perform miracles? What did he say? I never knew you. That was in Matthew. In Luke chapter 10, it says, I say to you, it will be more tolerable in that day for Sodom than for that city. In that day, this is the will of him who sent me, that all that he has given me, I lose nothing, but raise it up on the last day, John 6, 39. In John chapter 12, verse 48, he says, he who rejects me does not receive and, and, and does not receive my sayings has one who judge him. The word I spoke is what will judge him in the last day. In Romans chapter 2, verse 12, it says, On the day when, according to my gospel, God will judge the secrets of men through Christ Jesus. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, 8, it says, Who will also confirm you in the end, blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ? The day. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 13, Each man's work will become evident. For the day will show it because it is to be revealed with fire. And the fire itself will be tested, the quality of each man's work. In 1 Corinthians 5.5, 5, it says, I have um, decided to deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of his flesh so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. In Philippians chapter 1, verse 6, it says, For I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it 
until the day of Christ Jesus. Are you confident of that this morning? Are you confident that the one that started this good work in you is going to keep it going until that day? In Philippians chapter 1, verse 10, it says, says so that you may approve the things that are excellent in order to be um, sincere and blameless until the day of Christ. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 10, it says, when he comes to be glorified in his saints on that day and to be marveled at among whom have believed, for our testimony to you was believed. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 18, it says, For the Lord grant to him to find mercy from the Lord on that day, and you will very well, and you know very well what service he rendered at Ephesus. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, 8, I told you we're going to cover a lot of scripture today. In the future, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award me on that day, and not only me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Are you loving his appearing? Right? Amen. There's a crown of righteousness awaiting for you, right? Because we are in Christ Jesus. In Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25, not forsaking our assembling together as it is habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. In 2 Peter, we're getting to the end of them. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 10, it says, But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, in which the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the elements will be destroyed with intense heat, and the earth and its works will be burned up in that day. In 2 Peter 3, 12, it says, looking for the hastening of the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be destroyed by burning and the elements will melt with intense heat. In Jude chapter 1, verse 6, it says, the angels who did not keep their own dominion, domain, excuse me, um, but abandoned their, their proper abode, he has kept in eternal bonds under darkness for the judgment of that great day. So we see that there is a day coming. The Bible is very, very clear that there is a day coming, and with that day, there will be judgment, right? And the good news about being judged is that if you're in Christ, you're, you're judged according to Christ. A Christian has nothing to fear of judgment day. Because God doesn't see you in your flesh. He sees you in your spirit. And the more that you see yourself in your spirit rather than your flesh, the more you're going to act like Jesus. Amen? There's nothing to fear. But what will that day be like? What will that day be like? The final judgment day is the topic of the rest of Matthew 24 and all of Matthew 25. And Jesus answers, as Jesus answers the disciples' third question. And, and the, what's so, so interesting about this is, I'll, I'll let you know in advance, that Jesus tells them the same thing over and over and over and over again. You want to know why? Because we don't get it. We don't get it. It's this, he answers it multiple times, different ways, and says the same thing. So let's see if we can get it, all right? In Matthew 24, verse 37, this is Jesus' answer to the third question about the end of the world. In, in Matthew 24, verse 37, it says, For the coming of the Son of Man will be just like the days of Noah. So right, right away, we, 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 we think, think that he's talking about the sin is going to be rampant. It's going to be a horrible place to live. But is that how Jesus answers this question? He says, for as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in, in marriage until the day Noah entered the ark and they did not understand until the flood came 
and took them all away, so will the coming of the Son of Man be. He's saying that they're just living life. They're taken by total surprise. Jesus says that the great great judgment day will be likened unto the judgment of Noah's day. Jesus is wanting to impress on our minds that the final day of judgment will come as a surprise. Just in Noah's day. He goes on to say, verse 40, Then there will be two men in a field. One will be taken and one will be left. Two women will be gathering at the mill. One will be taken and one will be left. Again, here Jesus Jesus is saying this is going to happen suddenly, so be alert. It's just going to happen. It's going to just happen in a, in a blink of an eye. Everybody's going to be caught by surprise. And we'll, we're going to cover this scripture more when we, when we tackle the subject of the rapture. Okay? In verse 42, therefore, be on alert. For you do not know which day your Lord is coming. We don't know. So be ready. Be in Christ. But be sure of this, that if the head of the house had known at what time of night the thief was coming, he would have been ready, been on alert, and would have allowed, would not have allowed his house to be broken into. Verse 44, for this reason you also must be ready. For the Son of Man is coming at an hour when you do not think he will. So when you're thinking that the world is getting worse and worse, when you're thinking that sin is getting worse and worse, and you're thinking that, well, Jesus must be coming back soon, guess what? You're wrong. You want to know why? Because Jesus says when you when you don't think he's coming back, when things, when it, see, it, it, it's a totally different view. He's, he's saying, you're not going to be ready. It's going to be a surprise. You want to know why? Because the church is going to be getting better and better and better. The world is going to be better and better and better. The gospel of Jesus Christ is going to be manifest in the earth. The glory of God is going to be revealed in the earth. And, and it's just going to get better and better and better. And, and we're going to think, man, can, can, can heaven get any better than this? Am I wrong for believing that? Can I believe that? Can heaven get any better than this? And then all of a sudden, boom, he shows up. We weren't even ready for you. We weren't ready. Why? Because things, things were, we weren't expecting. See, we, <laughs> we look for all these reasons. Wow, well, this is how we can know he's coming back soon. Jesus, how many times has he said it? You're not going to know. It's a thief. It's just going to happen so quick. You're not, you're not, you, you're not going to be prepared for it. So you better stay alert at all times. Therefore, be ready. Look at this. Verse 45. Who then is a faithful and sensible slave, whom the, whom the master put in charge of his household to give them their food at proper time? Blessed is the slave whom the master finds so doing when he comes. Truly I say to you, that he will put him in charge of all his possessions. But if that evil slave says in his heart, my master's not coming for a long time, and begins to beat his fellow slaves and eat and drink with drunkards, the master of that slave will come on a day when he does not expect him, and at an hour which he does not know. And he will cut him into pieces. Man, that's loving Jesus there. He will cut him into pieces and assign him a piece with the hypocrites. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. What's the point? I mean, these parables that we're going through, there's been many, many sermons. I've preached from them. But we can't miss the main point of these parables. Jesus is is answering the disciples' question. The main point is judgment day, when it arrives... This is the foundational truth of these these parables. 
it will be a surprise with no warning. And therefore, we ex are exhorted to continue being diligent in the kingdom, living in and through the righteousness of God. The church isn't ever supposed to give up. No matter what the world looks like, we continue occupying till he comes back. We, we, are, we continue advancing the kingdom of God. We, we continue believing. So this takes us now to chapter 25 in the parable of the ten virgins waiting. In Matthew 25, verse 1, it says, Then the kingdom of heaven will be com comparable to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish, and five of them were prudent. For when the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them, but the prudent took oil in their flasks along with their lamps. Again, you've heard scripture saying the oil represents the Holy Spirit. It, you, you might be able to use those similarities in these parables. But the truth of the matter, the, the main point is being prepared for the return of Jesus. But at midnight, there was a shout. Behold the bridegroom. Come out and meet him. Then all those virgins rose, trimmed their lamps. The foolish said to the prudent, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the prudent answered, No, there will not be enough for us, and you too. Go instead to the dealers and buy some for yourself. First of all, that kind of falls apart is that it's talking about the oil representing the Holy Spirit. You can't give anybody the Holy Spirit from your, you can't divide the Holy Spirit, and you can't buy the Holy Spirit, right? It's talking about being prepared. In verse 10, and while they were going away to make the purchase, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went with him to the wedding feast, and the door was shut. Later, the other virgins also came, saying, Lord, Lord, open up for us. But he answered, Truly I say to you, I do not know you. Be on the alert then, for you do not know the day nor the hour. We do not know. Just live, just live in the kingdom constantly. Don't be slack. Don't, don't, don't. There's two, there's two ways that the church goes with this. The one is apathy. Where, you know, they've been saying that Jesus is coming back for 2,000 years. My grandma and grandpa said that Jesus was coming back. Right? And you see the, the church being apathetic and going the way of the world. Right? Then you have the other side that thinks he's coming back at any moment, constantly. Any, any little news article sends them into a, Jesus is coming back. And they get so in, wrapped in this idea that you've seen it in, in, 2000, in 2000, that they, they're storing up a whole bunch of, if Jesus is coming back, why are you storing up food? Jesus is saying, constantly stay right in the center. Live in me. Represent the kingdom. Live in God. Bring heaven to earth. Do not grow weary in well-doing. Be doing. Be a doer of the word and not a hearer only. And, 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 and these, these lessons are so obvious that we, we miss it. He's trying, Jesus is trying to get across is, is that God's people must be ready because Jesus could return at any time without warning. And that takes us to the servant that we're given the talents. These are all the same answers to the, to the same question. In, in Matthew 25, verse 14, Jesus says, says to the disciples and says to us, For it is just like a man about to go on a journey who called his own slaves and entrusted his possessions to them. To one he gave five talents, to another two, 
and to another one, each according to his own ability, and he went on his journey. Immediately, the one who received the five talents went out and traded with them, and he gained five more talents. In the same manner, the one who received two talents gained two more. But the one who received one talent went away, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. Now, after a long time, the master of those slaves came and settled his accounts with them. The one who said he received five talents came up and brought five more talents, saying, Master, you entrusted me with five talents. You've entrusted five talents to me. See, I have gained five more. I want you to point something out here. Notice the, the delay in this parable. The day of, of judgment is after a long time. Of, of the uh, reckoning the accounts is after a long time. This is totally different than how Jesus talked about the destruction of Jerusalem and, and uh, uh, the temple. It was immediately. And this is going to happen, this is going to happen, this is going to happen, boom. And then the, immediately after that. This is going to happen. Notice that there, we don't know, in, in this third question, we don't know when it's going to be. And it's going to be a long time. And just to constantly be prepared, though. So it says, the one, okay, we're done with that. Verse 22, or 21, 20, or yeah, 22. Also the one who had received the two t- talents came to him and said, Master, you entrusted me with two talents. Oh, my goodness. Master, you entrusted two talents to me. See, I have gained two more talents. That His master said to him, well done, good and faithful slave. You were faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. In verse 24, it says, And the one also who received one talent came up and said, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you did not scatter seed. That sounds like so many, so many Christians, and so many, un, uh, and, uh, actually, they're Christians, but they're unbelievers, because they don't believe God's good. You know, I, I would have done that, but, you know, God, you give and take away. You're a hard man. You send tests and trials to us, and I was afraid. There's so many people that have wasted their life and, 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 and they blame God for it. They blame God for it. And, and it says, and I was afraid and went and hid your talent in the ground. See, you have what is yours. But the master answered him and said to him, you wicked, lazy slave. You knew, and what he's saying is, this is your testimony of me. You knew that I reap where I don't, did not sow. And gather where I, um, where I scattered not seed. Then you ought to have put my money in the bank. And on my arrival, I would have received my money back with interest. See, our, we, we will be judged by our own testimony. Our own words will ensnare us. Therefore, take away the talent from him and give it to the one who has ten talents. For to everyone who has, more shall be given, and he will have an abundance. But from the one who does not have, even what he does have shall be taken away. Throw out the worthless slave into outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. See, Jesus is stating again that there is a coming judgment. There's a coming judgment, and the just, the justified will live by faith. They will live by faith in Christ Jesus and who they are in him. Each person will be accountable for what the master has put into their hands. We've all been given talents, both financially and Spiritually and physically, gifts, and we call it, that guy's very talented, right? God has gifted them, right? And we're supposed to be using it for the glory of God. 
So this takes us to the final passage where Jesus gives a description and a summary of the coming great day judgment. In Matthew 25, verse 31, it says, But when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, what a sight that's going to be, right? Then he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate them one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. Now, who, what is he separating? Nations. He's separating nations. There are going to be sheep nations, and there's going to be goat nations in the end, in that day. And he's going to separate them. And he will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Interesting, right and left. Um, then, 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 shh, shh. I apologize. Verse 34. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. This was prepared for us from the very beginning. God had it all planned out before you ever existed. He, had a, he, he has this, it's been his desire for you to be in this kingdom and in, 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 in to this bliss from the, very, from, from the Father's heart. It says, for, listen to this, for I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. Naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him and say, Lord, when did, you, when, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? And when did we see you a stranger and invite you in or naked and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? The king will answer and say to him, them, Truly I say to you, to the extent that you did it to the one of these my brothers of mine, even to the least of them, you did it to me. Verse 41, Then they themselves also answered, Lord, when did we see you hungry? or thirsty, or a stranger, or naked, and sick, or in prison, and did not take care of you. He's talking to the goats here. Then he answered them, and them, truly I say to you, to the extent that you did not do it to the least of these, you did not do it to me. I was a stranger, and you did not invite me in, naked, and you did not clothe me, and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then then the self answered, oh my goodness, I got these scripts screwed up. I'll just keep going, though. When did we see you hungry, thirsty, or stranger, naked, sick, or in prison, and did not take care of you? Then he was answered, when, when, truly I say to you, to the extent that you did not do it to the one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. These, these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous inter, into eternal life. You know, Jesus is talking about the end of the world here. And it, can it get any clearer that there is two destinations? Over and over again in each of these parables, he, he shows that there are two destinations at the end of the world, at the great judgment. And what did we just read here? Did we read that you have to clothe the sick, or clothe, clothe the naked, be, uh, um, visit those in prison, visit those that are sick, take care of those that are sick, those that are hungry. Is, what's, what's Jesus talking about here? He says, as you've done it to the least of my brethren. See, we need to, we need to, we need to interpret these parables with our secret in, interpretation tool called the Bible. Right? See, we take all these scriptures out of context, and we use them for good things. 
right? These are things that the church should be doing, right? But is that what Jesus is talking about? Who is he talking about here? He just separated what? Sheep and goats. And the sheep and goats represent what? Nations, types of nations. And nations are supposed to be doing these things to his brethren. Now, who is Jesus' brethren? Who are the least of these that Jesus is talking about? Well, he, he said his brethren in Mark chapter 3, verse 35, that whoever does the will of God, he is my brother, my sister, and my mother. And in John chapter 6, verse 29, Jesus answered and said to them, this is the work of God, that you believe in him who he has sent. So who are his brethren? Believers, the church. Let me clear it up for you a little bit more. Remember the, when Saul was going and persecuting, he, he was going out to persecute the church, to throw them in prison, to kill them. He, he had a, a, a bill from the, uh, the uh, Pharisees and the Sadducees giving him a law to be able to do this because they were the political system of Jesus' day, in case you didn't know that, the Sanhedrin. He, he, he had legal rights to go do this. And he's on the road to Damascus, and Jesus knocks him off his horse. He's blind, and he says, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Was Saul persecuting Jesus? No, he was persecuting the church. But that's not the way Jesus seen it. He says, As the le if you do it to the least of these, you've done it to me. That's our Lord. That's our King. That's how personable God takes it. God, Jesus takes it. God Almighty, when Saul, or when Stephen was being martyred, he says that he looked up and seen the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Nowhere in the Bible except right there do you ever read Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Everywhere else you see that he's seated. We have a God. We have a Lord. We have a King. We have a Savior. That when something happens to the least of these, he gets involved. He's standing up. He's honoring, he's honoring Stephen as he gives his life for his master. Nations will be judged in the way that they treat the church. Can I have the worship team come back up? The best is yet to come. The church is going to rise up. There, will there be goat nations? Yeah, we just read it. But there's sheep nations too. And will the church in the United States of America, in this nation, will we be making a sheep nation? Will we stand up and be a sheep nation? Or will we, will we allow it to become a goat nation? You know, right now in China, they're coming into people's homes because of this COVID deal. And they're telling them that if they want government assistance, they have to take down their crosses and any religious symbols. They have to put up pictures of Mao and who's the president now? Chi. And deny Jesus Christ. You know, I believe with all my heart that the Christians in China it will turn China around. If you look at history, that's what's always done it. We have history on our side. 
The church is what has always turned the world and made it a better place. And and then the church here in the United States needs to start waking up, being diligent, using our talents, our gifts, and our abilities for the glory of, of God, being found doing when the king returns. We should, we should be so busy doing that all of a sudden we're shocked. Oh, you came back? We're too, we're, we're too busy. We spend more time trying to figure out something that Jesus promised you. You would never know when it's going to, everybody's going to be surprised. And we use it as a distraction from actually doing what the church is called to do. In all these lessons, in all these scriptures we just read, Jesus makes it clear over and over again. First, that the Father has appointed a day. Second, on that day, that one day, the King of Kings, Jesus Christ, will return. And when he does, he will judge the righteous and the unrighteous. So right now, i got to clear this up for you guys. Make sure that you know. How do you know if you're righteous or unrighteous? Is it because you're at church this morning? Does that make you righteous? No. Is it because you never said a crossword to your wife or your husband? No. Is it because you... Give your money to a charity or, or, or the church. No, that doesn't make you righteous. What makes you righteous is that if you have trusted in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, his righteousness is your righteousness. You become born again with his very spirit. You are holy and set apart in Christ Jesus. Your spirit is made new. That is how you know if you're righteous or unrighteous. It's all about what you do with Jesus. What you do with Jesus. It's all about Jesus. This whole book is about Jesus. And we know from parable after parable that the righteous go into the eternal reward and the unrighteous to eternal punishment. Don't let anyone mislead you. Jesus spoke it out of his mouth. Parable after parable after parable. This is what the end of the world is going to look like. In that day, no one knows. No one knows. So you know what? When you see that YouTube video on 10 signs Jesus is coming back, You don't even have to waste your time because no one knows. No one knows. That day will happen when the world least expects it. But that day is coming. That day is coming. We have a job to do, church. We we, we have the job of making his enemies his footstool. We have, we have a job of, of redeeming and restoring the earth, as Peter said in Acts. We have a job to bring heaven to earth, to, answer, to be the answer by allowing God to work through us, being the answer to Jesus' prayer. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You, do you think his prayer is not going to go unanswered? Amen. This is so good. And, and, and the thing of it is, is right now I can feel there's a weight that comes on people. Like, this is a lot of responsibility, Chad. This seems tough. No, it's not. Because you don't do it in your strength. You do it in the grace of God. You do it by the Spirit of God. You do it by, by His power and His might. You just do it. 
you, you just, God speaks to you about something that you are to do, something you're to say, something you're to start, something, and you just take a step and say, okay, Lord, I know I can't do it. And how do you know if God's calling you to do it? Because you can't do it. If you could do it, he wouldn't tell you to do it. Because you can do things that you, can, that you know how to do or you can do, right? You know it's God when he says, when you look at it and say, there's no way I can do that. You know, some, some, God puts a desire in your heart. God puts a desire in your heart, and right away you say, man, that'd be good for Pastor Chad to do, or that'd be good for so-and-so to do. No, he put the desire in your heart, but I can't do it. You're right. But he wouldn't have put the desire in your heart if he didn't already make the provision for you to be able to do it. You know, when God created the earth, when God created the earth, he didn't create man first. He created everything that man would need to prosper and have success first. Right? Because if he created man for, first, he'd be treading water for a couple days. Right? He'd be in the dark. He'd be on the earth and all of a sudden trees would be shooting up left and right all around him. No. God provided everything. And then when he, after everything was provided, then he put man and woman in the garden. Listen. God has a destiny and a plan for your life. And if he has called you to it, if, if he's put that desire in your heart, if he's given you imaginations that are, and thoughts that are higher, just greater than, than you could ever hope or dream of, of happening, that means that he has already provided for that to come to pass. God always makes provision before he sends. When he sent, sent the Israelites to the promised land, the promised land was already there, wasn't it? Amen. Amen. The best is yet to come. Jesus promised that the best is yet to come. Even in that great day, even in the great judgment day, for the believer in Christ Jesus, it will be the best day of your life. It's going to be glorious. It's going to be marvelous. And words will not be able to art accurately articulate that day. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you. We thank you that uh, you have not left us questioning. You have answered so clearly and accurately. And Father, we just ask that you would help us to keep the main thing the main thing. And the main thing is Jesus. The main thing is proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom. The main thing is to preach the gospel to the nations. For the gospel is the only hope of salvation and redemption for this earth. There is no greater ideology. There is no greater philosophy. There is no greater way to live in this earth than the way of our King. So Father, we just thank you that when we live in days of turmoil right now, when we live in days of chaos, when we live in days when darkness covers so many minds, that we won't have to worry about what we are to say. For in that hour, you will tell us exactly what we need to say. That we have the wisdom of God within us. We have understanding. And we just ask that you would help us to be good stewards. To be dependent on Holy Spirit. To have boldness to speak up and stand for justice. 
stand for righteousness, to live boldly for you. This whole world seems to be twisted and angry and looking. And what they don't realize is everything that they are angry about, everything that they don't understand, everything they're twisted, anything that they're envious about, everything that they're enraged about, it can be found in you. You are the hope of the nations. You are my hope. You have calmed my heart and you have brought me peace. Has he done that for you, church? Is there anything lacking in Jesus? The only thing that's lacking in Jesus is our lack of understanding. He is the Alpha and Omega. He is the beginning. He's the end. He's the author, and he is the perfecter, the finisher of our faith. Everything, everything is held together through him. He is the great I am. And he is our soon coming king. We just love you. We praise you. And we close in worship to you, Jesus, our Lord. Amen. You've been listening to a message from Karis New Testament Church. For more information or to contact us, go to www.karisntc.org. And remember, you are deeply loved, highly favored, and destined to reign in Christ Jesus.